And uh, last name is Worstel, and I am the area representative for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for Madison, Antelope, Pierce, and Stanton County uh, here in this area. This is what they call my footprint. So um, glad to be here sharing with you. Uh, my, my role at FCA is to connect with coaches uh, who have a sphere of influence that they get to, to use that sphere of influence as they grow in their faith with Jesus Christ. Uh, as they grow in that, they get to use that sphere of influence uh, to have an effect on their athletes, uh, their other coaches, that kind of thing. So uh, I get to, to build relationships with coaches. One thing I was surprised about, I, I knew I'd be able to build relationships with coaches, but I never knew that I would be able to have friendships with coaches. Uh, and there's been several that I've gotten to know really well. One that invited me to work out with him, uh, which was kind of a cool deal. Uh, we do that three days a week. So that's just been a lot of fun. Um, but I will be switching my role with FCA uh, here in the next month and a half, uh, beginning June, uh, June 1st, I'm going to be stepping into the role of marketing director for the state of Nebraska, uh, not just focused here on uh, Northeast, but helping our staff across the state uh, as we tell the story of what God is doing in and through the lives of coaches and athletes across our state. Not what FCA is doing what God is doing through this ministry. So I'm super excited about that. Wanted to kind of give you guys an update on that as well. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So I am firmly planted in Generation X. The oh well, whatever, never mind generation, right? I'm, I'm thrilled for this. I love being a Gen Xer. Uh, we had amazing music. Uh, U2. DC Talk, Phil Collins. Uh, we had amazing television, Voltron, Defender of the Universe, right? We had friends. I heard somebody was saying, how you doing earlier today, right? That was a friends thing, yeah. We had Knight Rider. We had some great TV. We had great movies, Goonies, Never Say Die. Uh, that great Christmas movie, Die Hard. Uh, we had Back to the Future, all three Back to the Futures, as a matter of fact. And we had amazing food, right? Jello pudding pops. Does anybody remember Jello pudding pops? No, yeah? Those were the best, and they got rid of them. I don't even know why they got rid of them. They were amazing. We had Chuck E. Cheese, which I know is still around, but man, when Chuck E. Cheese was, was our thing, it was like Vegas for kids, right? I mean, we had Cool Ranch Doritos. Now, I know they're still Cool Ranch Doritos, but man, they were brand new back in our day, right? We rode our bikes outside until the street lights came on, and then we played on Nintendos as long as the cartridges worked, because if they didn't work, you had to blow on them to get them going, right? Man, we had it hard back in the day. Oh, gosh. We jumped on pogo balls, and we folded paper notes to pass in class, and we wore way too much flannel. Am I right? Us Gen Xers, we're, we're getting older now. I'm almost 50, a couple years away from that. And I'm convinced that you know that you're getting old when you hear high school pet bands at football or basketball games playing the songs that you knew when they were brand new, right? Yeah, that's how you know you're getting old. <laughs> the other thing I love about being a Gen Xer is that we're currently flying under the radar. All the current beef between generations seems to, be, seems to be between the boomers and the, the millennials or the Gen Z. You know, those, those seems to be where the, where the tension is. We're just a bunch of chill slackers who don't get too riled up. But I guess, um, yeah, now that I say that out loud, <laughs> uh, it might not be a good thing. We might just be the passive generation that does not stand firm on truth and ultimately leads to what we're gonna be talking about today and that we are, there we go, we're one generation away from closing our doors. So what does that even mean, right? Well, first of all, this is not any church's 10-year plan, I can tell you that. That's not their 10-year vision of what we wanna do is we wanna close our doors in 10 years, no. That's not the idea. It simply means that if we don't do the things that we'll be talking about today, there won't be local churches that teach the Bible within a generation. 
I'll never forget whenever the concept of this first hit me square between the eyes. Several years ago, the staff of LifePoint, the, ch the church that I'm an elder at down in, in, uh, in Norfolk, some elders, ministry leaders, and staff, we went on this epic road trip down to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And we went to a conference at a church called Village Church. Uh, in the middle of this, of this teaching uh, by Pastor Matt Chandler, who's the, the pastor, the lead, the lead teaching pastor at that church, another attendee who was there had got up to leave the room because her baby that she had with her was crying. Pastor Chandler stopped his teaching and graciously asked her to stay. And then he said something that stuck hard. He said, we love the sound of children in our services. A church without children is a dying church. This idea that we're one generation away from closing our doors is something that should shake us to our core. It should call us as believers to action. We know from scripture that we are sent to send, that discipleship isn't just a program that happens in the church, it's the call of the church. And this, this is no different. Matthew 28 clearly states that we are to go and make disciples. I mean, what better chance to make disciples than those that we call sons, daughters, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, kids, and teens. We bicker and we complain about the next generation, when in reality, the Bible commands us to educate them and remind them of what God has done. And I'd say this isn't just limited to younger people in age, but also younger people in their faith. So where does scripture talk about this? Where does it say that we should do this? Well, there are several places, um, but today I wanna focus on one particular Psalm, and that's Psalm 78. If you have your Bibles and wanna open there, you can. We will have it on the screens if you wanna follow along. But the Psalms in general, they're very interesting to say the least. They're not just a collection of poems and hymns. I mean, they are those things. But each one of the 150 Psalms that we have in scripture is at least one of five specific types. And those types are this, we have Psalms of praise. And now these are just straightforward hymns of praise that begin with a call and then give reasons why we should praise God. Songs of royalty, and they are, they are specifically directed to King David's dynasty and its rule in Jerusalem. We have songs of lament, which typically begin with a cry out, a plea to God for deliverance, but they also express faith that God will hear and offer words of praise in advance. God, I'm going through this hard thing. I know you're with me. I trust you, I praise you for what you're gonna do. Songs of imprecation, they're similar to laments, they're this cry out, but they are calling down curses from heaven on God's enemies. And then Psalms of wisdom. And these ones are contributions of wisdom teachers of Israel. And this Psalm 78, this is a Psalm of wisdom. So let's read it. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 8. And it says this. It says, A maskil of Asaph. So let's just put pause right there. Uh, if you had maskil or Asaph on your bingo card for words that would be used in the sermon today, you win a prize. <laughs> if you're actually playing bingo, an actual bingo card, you might be in the wrong place. Um, but if you think that, you know, sermon bingo is a good idea, uh, see Brooke after church and maybe he can get that published. You never know. Uh, who in the world is Asaph and what in the world is a maskil? As I said, this is a psalm of wisdom. It was written by a, a wise person who was not named David or Solomon who lived in Israel during that era, during that era. See, not all the Psalms were written. Not all of them were written by David, as you might have been told. This dude, Asaph, he was, well, he was a well-known musician, musician and composer 
of hymns. Kind of think of him as like the Chris Tomlin of his day. This particular hymn that he had written is known as a maskil. It was a more contemplative psalm of wisdom, and it was intended to instruct God's people. So let's continue on. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. He will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. So this contemplative psalm of wisdom, it starts off by calling others to listen. As with any scripture, we need to understand what it was meant to those it was originally written to before we can understand how it applies or what it can mean for us. The children of Israel had been on their own, out of Egypt, out of Egyptian captivity. They've been through the desert on a horse with no name, settled in the promised land, given their own laws, decided to worship idols, fell into trouble, cried out to God for rescue. Asked for a king, they got judges instead. Lather, rinse, repeat. This process happened over and over and over again. Finally, they get their king. And all the while, they forgot where they started from, back in Egypt. And this isn't just the first season of the prequel to to, to the chosen. This is seasons 1 through 200. This happened over many, many Many generations, fathers and mothers, failed to tell their children about what God had done. Grandparents stopped putting their grandkids on their knees to tell of Yahweh. What Asaph was trying to remind them of in the beginning of this psalm, it it was a summons to listen, to pay attention. With his platform, with his, his influence, he was about to call them to bring back that practice. Now, for clarity's sake, in verse 2, uh, it says, I will, open, uh, I will open my mouth, I will utter dark sayings from of old. Now, this isn't mythical or magical speech. That wasn't elvish or black speech, the language of Mordor and Lord of the Rings. But, but rather, it was a concept that would have been difficult to understand. So, Asaph was getting them to listen close. He goes on to tell them what these sayings were. Things that we have heard and known that our father, our fathers have told us. There we go. Here, Asaph is telling them to recall what the Lord has done. I'm sure some of those who were, some of those were, some of those Israelites, the children of Israel, they were continuing to follow God and remain faithful and had remembered and told the next generation, and so on and so on. But as a whole, this is something that we see throughout the Old Testament with the children of Israel, forgetting what God had done. But this also isn't new information. Asaph may have been a wise man, but he wasn't a prophet of God. He wasn't speaking on God's behalf to the children of Israel. As we look again at verse 3, things that we have heard and known. This is a topic that was already on the minds of Israel. Why? Because our fathers had told us. So how often, how often do we recall what the Lord has done? I really don't have a good memory, I'll be honest with you, in all transparency. Um, Just ask my wife... um, Help me out. 
Melanie. Melanie, that's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> I, it's a joke. Of course, I remember her name. I also remember her birthday, which is coming up on Tuesday, by the way. Uh, and I remember our anniversary. So those things, I'm, I'm, I'm good with those. Uh, but I also remember all the lyrics to Ice Ice Baby. And who was in the more cowbell sketch on Saturday Night Live? You know, all the important things up here bouncing around. Uh, recent conversations, though, honestly, they're, they're tricky. They're tricky as, as well as what I'm supposed to get at Hy-Vee on our way home from church today. I often need to be reminded of how God has worked in my life. I can look back and see how he's moved and molded me. One example of, of this is, is how he called us to Nebraska through my in-laws who purchased the Abbey Christian store uh, in Norfolk and asked us to move from California to help them operate it. We ran the store from 2012 until we closed it in 2021. While closing was a hard decision to make, God blessed us as we were following his lead. We sold all but about $150 worth of merchandise. In the nine years there, it allowed us to form relationships and friendships with people from across the whole Northeast Nebraska area, along with pastors from many, many churches all over. If it wasn't for a relationship with your pastor, I wouldn't be here today. So, and what you guys do as far as giving at Christmas time, I'm always thrilled to hear about that. So, um, as we close the store, and as Melanie had already been working at, at Faith Regional, uh, I needed to hear from God where my next steps were. And thanks to a fish fry in Pierce, God provided that path onto staff with FCA uh, with a conversation with our, our area director. All those connections that have been made in my time at the Abbey have been an on-ramp for me to be able to make connections with coaches and volunteers in all of these communities. And now it's gonna even go further in my new role as well. When we can recall what the Lord has done, it helps us to put our trust in him when we don't see the outcome. It also adds to our testimony, which is what Asaph here is challenging the people with. This is what he's telling them to do. Add to your testimony. What has God done in your life? Where have you seen him move in your life, your family, your job? Where have you seen God's faithfulness? Recall those things. Remember what he's done. But don't just stop there. Don't just sit in that. We need to also recount what the Lord has done. If we look at verse 4, it says, We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. So here it is, right? Here is what is supposed to be told. He was determined to pass along three reminders to the next generation. He was passing on that we have to see the glorious deeds of the Lord. Glorious deeds like giving them the promised land. Reminding them of God's might. God's might parting a, a, a sea, a huge gigantic lake, bigger than a lake, parting this just so they could walk through on dry land. And he wanted to remind them of his wonders. Creation, yes, absolutely. But also, he brought water from a rock. That's amazing. His wonders are amazing, and he is reminding them of these. He exhorts the parents not to hide these from their children. If we look back to Deuteronomy 6, uh, we'll see exactly what Asaph is referring to. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 6 as well, you can. This is what it says. It says, In these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The role of discipleship 
And that's exactly what this is, discipleship. This role is first and foremost the obligation of parents to their children, not the obligation of the church you attend or the school that you send them to. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, I love this quote. He said, the more parental teaching, the better. Ministers and Sunday school teachers were never meant to be substitutes for mother's tears and father's prayers. Now, I am confident. I'm confident that here at Calvary Bible Church, you recognize this mission field that walks into your building each week. And I'm confident that you will unashamedly share the good news of Jesus with them. But I hope that that sinks in for those of you that are parents and grandparents today. Discipleship begins at home. You are going to influence your kids one way or the other. There's no doubt about that. But how are you going to influence them? How can you accomplish this? Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. This is what this verse is saying is that you're never not to be recounting what the Lord has done. This means on your way to sports ball practice or between episodes of Bluey or during potty training or in the waiting room of the ER after a fall or on a daddy-daughter date before bedtime, during breakfast. Look for these opportunities to teach this next generation. It also helps one generation avoid the errors of the previous generations. Hey kid, learn from my mistakes and trust in Jesus. Now in, a, in an attempt to be vulnerable, it was kind of difficult for me to write this about parenting. Melanie and I, we don't, we don't have kids of our own. One of the main reasons is that due to some medical issues, it just hasn't been possible. And we're fully aware that there are other options to, to, to having children. Um, but quite honestly, we've also never felt that call from the Lord to have kids. Now, it doesn't mean we don't like kids. We we love kids. Uh, we've been able to be aunt and uncle to several children, both blood-related and close friends' kids. And to be honest, there might be others here who are in that same spot. You, too, have the same chances and same obligations to recount what the Lord has done. Not having children is not a free pass to not have to do the work. Melanie and I both love that we get to shepherd, disciple, and serve others of varying ages. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was able to remind a coach and a good friend that his identity is not based on where he wants to be in life, but where God has currently placed him, and he is to be faithful in that. If, if you're a believer, you are further down the path of faith than someone else. You're also not as far down the path of faith as someone else. It's this awesome space to be in. You get to pour into others also while being poured into. This is generational thinking that we can all apply to our lives, whether we're parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, family, friends, coworkers, students. Wherever you are in life, you can influence the next generation to Jesus and the gospel. Recount what the Lord has done, which means to use words. There's a phrase that you hear every once in a while. I'm not sure who it's accredited to. I've heard in the past that it was Mother Teresa. Uh, and the, the quote is, share the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. And I would say it's absolutely necessary to use words. Matthew 28 is clear. Go and preach. Go and teach. Um, in, in Romans 10, it says, How can they believe in, in whom they haven't heard? And how can they hear without somebody telling them? 
This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go and tell. And the gospel, the gospel is not a hard thing to share. It's quite easy if you get down to the brass tacks. It comes down to, to four simple concepts. God, man, Christ, and response. God loves you. John 3.16 says, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And the fact is, is that man is sinful. Sin separates us. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But Jesus has rescued, Jesus rescues you. God put a plan into place that would send Jesus away for us to have that rescue. Romans 5.8 says, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, that Jesus died for us. And then that response part is, will you trust Jesus? Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that we will be saved again, it's telling, it's actual out loud speaking. But it could be even easier than that. It could be even just telling someone about who you were before you met Christ, how you came to meet Christ, and who you are after. I love that FCA is so focused on discipleship. It's not just youth group for jocks, but it's an organization that sees the value of the sphere of influence that coaches and athletes have in today's world. FCA's vision is to see the world transformed by Jesus Christ through the influence of coaches and athletes, not just the sports world, the entire world. Our mission is to, leave, is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Our strategy is through discipleship, how we get that done. Some faithful servants on FCA staff have developed a, a discipleship framework called E3, and E3 stands for Engage, Equip, and Empower. There's so much more to it than just that, but I just wanted to give you a taste of how, yes, discipleship begins in the home, but it's not limited to the home. We all, as believers, need to recount what the Lord has done to others. Finally, we repeat what the Lord has done, meaning to do this again and again and again. Go ahead and keep your fingers there in Deuteronomy if you would, but let's jump back to Psalm 78. In verse 5, it says, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. Do you see how many generations are mentioned in this passage? I count four. Most put up three. I count four. We see the fathers, right? And their children. And then the next generation yet unborn and their children. That's four generations of sharing what God has done, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. In the same way in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we see this same generational thinking, but in a discipleship ideology. It says this. It says, what, there we go. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Here in this passage, we see Paul, who is writing this to Timothy. He's the me in this. And he's writing it to you, who is Timothy. Timothy is entrusting it to faithful men who will then in turn teach others. Repeating what the Lord has done passes on the truth of God to others so that they might believe as well. Earlier I said that I remember all the lyrics to Ice Ice Baby, um, and that's mainly because I listened to it on repeat. But we're going to talk about some generational differences again here, right? When I was a teenager, the, 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 the internet was only in its fledgling stage. Uh, we had to use dial-up, which meant that it was not always connected. Uh, this is also before Napster, iTunes, uh, Spotify, YouTube, iPods, smartphones, all that stuff. 
If we wanted to listen to a song on demand, we'd have to find a blank cassette tape, put it in a boombox, play our favorite radio station, and then sit poised with our fingers on the play and record button. So as soon as it started playing, we could hit those two buttons. You guys, does this, anybody remember this, right? Oftentimes we'd record the DJ talking over the beginning of the song, uh, but there were long intros back then, so it was okay. Then we'd listen and hit stop at the end, rewind the cassette, um, and then listen to the song again, rewind it again, and maybe write down the lyrics if we even understood what they were saying. We'd continue this process over and over just to be able to sing or rap along. <laughs> and heaven forbid something should go wrong with your tape, you'd have to get a pencil out and rewind it that way. Oh goodness. Man, we had it rough. Imagine making a mixtape for those of you that are Gen Z or millennials, that's what you, know, you call a, a playlist now. Imagine making a mixtape for your boyfriend or girlfriend in this capacity, man, it was, that's dedication. So if we jump back to Deuteronomy chapter six, it says this, it says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. By the time that Jesus arrives, the children of Israel took this passage so literally that they began to fashion small boxes that contained scripture, and, and they, they would put them on their heads with leather straps. Um, I was going to try and pull this off by creating one, but I didn't get an opportunity to. The best thing I could think of is whenever you put like a headlamp on to work on your car or something like that, it kind of looks ridiculous a little bit, but I guess it's functional in that way. But the boxes became more opulent and ornate. They grew in size. And the fancier your box, the more spiritual you were. It got to the point where Jesus called out the Pharisees in Matthew 23 for this practice. Now, I don't think that we need to be that extreme, right? But you know what? There are many, many resources that you can find online that are just a Google away that can be just as handy for repeating what the Lord has done. Or maybe you can attach post-it notes with scripture verses on your mirror as you get ready in the morning. You can listen to the Bible on your way to work or out in the field as you're farming. Scripture memorization is another great way to repeat what the Lord has done. All of these are great practices that don't show off your spirituality to others but they can help you to recall, recount, and repeat what the Lord has done. Repetition breeds familiarity. When the praises of the Lord, God's strength, and his wonderful works are familiar to us, we can't help but tell them to those that are around us. And why? Why should we recount or recall recount and repeat what the Lord has done. Again, let's jump back and finish up with Psalm 78. It says this in verses 7 and 8, that they should set their hope in God, not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let us not be a people who forgets and becomes stubborn and rebellious. Let us be a people who remain steadfast and faithful to the God who is faithful to us and avoid being one generation away from closing our doors. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises that we find in it. Uh, that you have set things in motion uh, from the beginning of time, uh, from page three, whenever we, as mankind, when we messed up, Lord, you sent, um, set things in motion so that your son, Jesus, could come and rescue us from our sin. Heavenly God, allow that to be something that sticks with us.
And not just something that we sit in, but something that we remember and that we tell others. We tell our family members, we tell our children, we tell uh, our coworkers, we tell people that we are just in relationship with. That this wouldn't be something we just keep to ourselves because if we keep it to ourselves, we just sit and take it in and not go and share it. Then Lord, this kind of thing is gonna come to an end. Lord, we know that you're faithful. We know that there are those that are faithful to, to, to share the good news, to share unashamedly um, your word. I pray that you give those people, I pray that you give them hope and you give them strength. Lord, I pray that us, as we walk out of here today, that we would be renewed in that strength. We praise you. We glorify your gracious and holy name. Amen.